to see you guys we've been praying for it. we're so glad to worship the resurrected savior with you this morning happy easter to you welcome to stonegate church uh, my name is jimmy i'm one of the pastors here and uh this is this is a special day y'all every day is special because he's risen uh but we get to focus in on it today and, and we just we're acknowledging this whole weekend of the accomplishment of jesus on our behalf and we know that there would be no empty tomb without the sacrifice of our savior so we're going to treasure the whole work of jesus today his life and his death and his resurrection so let's celebrate the sacrifice of our savior in this song let's bless his name here we go the sea none would come close you wouldn't let go what worked back then will work again I know the blood is still the blood I have Try them all, my last try. I crawl. What worked back then, it will work again. Cause I know the blood is still the blood. Sing, oh, how precious, how beautiful this priceless love.
is what the blood does, church. We bless your name this morning. We bless your name because you're worthy. You sent your son to purchase us back from the dead. He lived for us. He died the death that we should have died. And then he got up and rose from the grave, defeating death, declaring to sin and Satan and death and hell and everything else that he is the son of God in power. And we're here today because he's changed our lives. He's making all things new. And we love him for him. We love you for him. We're so thankful that you sent your spirit to awaken in us a love for you. So God, this morning, like every Sunday, God, we boast in the resurrection. We boast in the accomplishment of Jesus. And we ask you, like we do every Sunday here, God, would you awaken in us new affection for you? where our hearts have been cold toward this news, where, where we may have been on the fringes of this news, w- would you let it hit us in a, in a way that, that unlocks joy for us, gladness of heart. This is the greatest news in the universe. This isn't just a, a tradition that we do once a year. This is everything. So God, come and make it everything in our mind, in our hearts, through the preaching of your word, the singing of your word, the reading of your word. God, do that for us, we pray. We love you, we love you, we love you. In Jesus' good name we pray. And God's people said, amen. Would you please stay standing for the reading of God's word? Good morning, Stonegate. Before we read this morning's scripture, We have a very full audience. Would you please gather your things and move towards the center of your row so that those coming in would have a place to sit on the end of the aisle. Thank you so much. 
This morning, we are reading from Luke, chapter 24, <clears throat> excuse me, verses 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold... Two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now, it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. <clears throat> but these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen clothes by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. Stonegate, happy Easter to you. How are we this morning? All right, this is like the day of all days. We are celebrating the life, death, and the resurrection of Jesus today. So here, here's where I want to start with you, is to think about and hold up this word for all of us to think about, uh, this word gospel. It's a huge, big, biblical word. And what does that word mean? Well, the gospel is good news. That's what the word gospel means. It's great news. Our gospel is the best of news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, William Tyndale wants said about the good news of Jesus, he, he said, it, it makes a man's heart glad. It makes him sing and dance and want to leap for joy. That's what our good news does. That's the good news that we're celebrating this morning. That's what it does to a human heart. The good news changes lives. Uh, one of the ways we illustrate that is uh, just by thinking about a, a group of POWs. They're, they're just in a horrible situation. They're fenced in. They're abused daily. They're starving. Uh, they're, they're, you know, they look half dead behind that fence there. Some are dying each day, but after months of tinkering with the radio, it, it finally comes to life, and they, they dial it in, and they hear news on that radio that allied forces, American forces, are just a few miles away from where they are. Now, think about what happens inside of, of that uh, camp. Uh, think about the guards. They, they turn around just to see this crazy sight. These gaunt men, these starving men are all of a sudden laughing and cheering and banging on pots and pans and just going wild in there. Think about how bewildered you would be. Now, just consider what's happening inside that camp. Nothing has changed inside that camp. But at the same time, everything has changed inside those men's hearts. That, friends, is the difference good news makes. The gospel is good news. And our gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is good news of a resurrection. It's good news of a resurrection. 2,000 years ago, the sun rose on a group of ladies. You just heard the story. Uh, these ladies were ready to tend to the body of the crucified Jesus. But instead of finding a dead body, they found an empty tomb. They found an empty tomb. The angel looked at them and said, he is not here. And here's why he's not here. He has risen. Church, we don't just uh, worship a uh, Jesus who lived in our place, as great as that is. And we don't just worship a Jesus who lived and died in our place. Church, we worship the Jesus 
who lived in our place, died in our place, and walked out of the tomb on the third day. Amen? That's the Jesus that, that we worship. Uh, the Jesus who conquered Satan, sin, and death uh, on that Sunday morning a couple of thousand years ago. And, and Stonegate, that empty tomb, it is everything for us. Everything. Uh, imagine if someone found the bones of Jesus over in the Middle East. Uh, just imagine the moment. He, he hasn't risen from the dead. Uh, they have just found his bones still in that tomb. A book a few years ago came out on that, uh, that very possibility, just considering that, thinking about that. And what was most interesting about that book was the responses of people uh, to that possibility of someone finding the bones of Jesus. And listen to one pastor respond to that. What, what if someone found the bones of Jesus? Here's how this pastor responded. He said, if the bones of Jesus were to be discovered, it'd be a big finding. It would cause us to adjust our understanding of Christianity. But ultimately, the truth and power of Christianity would remain undisturbed. We'd still have all of Jesus' teaching, and we'd have all the stories, and we would have all of his wonderful examples of love for the outcast. And even though Easter wouldn't be about the physical resurrection of Jesus, we'd go on celebrating the example and testimony of this great man of God who lives on in our hearts and who inspires us to be kind to others. Even if the tomb wasn't empty, he goes on to say our hearts would still be full. I mean, it sounds so good. But just imagine Paul who wrote 1 Corinthians 15. It's like the resurrection chapter in the New Testament. Just imagine you reading 1 Corinthians 15 and imagine what Paul would say back to that pastor. He would look back at him and say, are you crazy? Have you lost your mind? No, things would not go on the same. No, that's not true. Why? Because the, uh, the resurrection is everything. The empty tomb is everything to the apostle Paul. And it is everything to us. For 20 centuries, the church has gathered on Easter Sunday to celebrate the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Because the resurrection is not some, you know, nuanced theological point. It's not, it's not a nuanced theological point. It is central to Christianity. It is the hinge on which the whole of our faith hangs. That, that is how important it is. John Stott is right when he says, Christianity at its essence is a resurrection religion. Yes and amen to that. The empty tomb is everything. He goes on to say, if you remove it, Christianity is destroyed. Church, that's true. If Jesus is dead, then Christianity is dead. Without the resurrection, there is no good news. Without the resurrection, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, we as followers of Jesus are to be most pitied in the world. The resurrection is everything. The empty tomb is everything. And here is what Easter Sunday announces. Good news of a resurrection. That Jesus is alive. Friends, that empty tomb is everything to us. And I want to spend just a couple of minutes thinking about why that is. Why is the empty tomb everything? Let me give you three reasons why. Here's reason number one. The empty tomb is everything because the empty tomb makes peace possible. It makes peace possible. Uh, imagine someone coming to you and asking you this question. What is the world's greatest problem? I mean, there's a lot of problems in our world, right? But what is the world's greatest problem? Is it poverty? Uh, is it a lack of education, disease, sickness, war, starvation, moral disintegration? I mean, all of those, when they show up in your living room of your life, it, it just produces all sorts of devastation in our lives. But are those the greatest problem? I, any one of those? According to the scriptures, those are not the greatest problems. They're, they're really just all symptoms of the one great problem. According to the Bible, our greatest problem is spiritual alienation. That's your greatest problem. My greatest problem. It's spiritual alienation. Our greatest problem is Isaiah 59 two, that our sin has separated us from God. Or as Paul says in Romans chapter 5 verse 10, that because of our sin, we are now enemies of God. 
That, that's our greatest problem, that there is now hostility in the relationship between us and God. And that hostility runs in two different directions. It runs from us to God. Human beings are not born with blank slates. That, that's not the way we come out of the womb. According to uh, Paul in Romans 8, this is the way we come out of the womb. With minds that are set on the flesh. Right? This is how Paul described it. He said, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. That, that's the way we come out of the womb. With hostility in our relationship up from us toward God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. According to the scripture, sin has so distorted the desires of our heart that when we are born, we are born with an instinctive sort of desire to resist God, with an instinctive disdain for God. We come out of the womb wanting to be God, not wanting to worship God. This is how you're born. This is how I'm born. And every parent knows this, by the way. Uh, You don't have to teach your kid to want to punch back. You don't have to teach your kid to lie to get their way. You don't have to teach your kid to demand that you give them what they want. We all come out of the womb knowing how to do that really well. Right? right? This is how we're all born. From us to God, there's hostility. But it also goes from God to us. It's not just that we have a problem with God. It's also that God has a problem with us. This is how the storyline of the Bible starts. It starts by uh, telling us that God is the creator of everything, that God is perfectly holy. And then you get to Genesis chapter 3, just a couple of chapters in, and we learn that we have sinned against God, and that sin has been passed down to every one of our first parents' descendants, all the way to you and to me. And we learn that our sin has rightfully provoked God's wrath. And because of our sin... If something doesn't change, one day we'll experience the unrestrained, nothing held back wrath of God forever. And it will undo us. That's the fruit of spiritual alienation. That, that's the fruit of our sin against God. And if spiritual alienation is our greatest problem, then reconciliation is our greatest need. The the greatest need in your life and in my life is is spiritual reconciliation, reconciliation with God. And friends, without the resurrection, there is no reconciliation with God. It requires, reconciliation requires a resurrection. This is Paul's point in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17. Paul says it this way, and if Christ has not been raised, like if we can still go find the bones of Jesus somewhere in the Middle East, If he's not been raised, if there is no resurrection, here's what that means for you and I. Your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Friends, without the resurrection, the events of Good Friday mean nothing. It was just a good guy having a really bad day. But Paul's point in 1 Corinthians 15 is there has been a resurrection. He's announcing good news of a resurrection, that Jesus did walk out of the grave, that Jesus is alive, and he's letting us know that that resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus, makes peace possible. That's the good news of the empty tomb. So what does the resurrection show us? Here is the testimony of the scriptures with the resurrection. According to the scriptures, the resurrection shows that the father was satisfied with the son's sacrifice for our sin. That's what the resurrection shows, that the father was satisfied with the son's sacrifice for our sin. You could think of it like this. The resurrection was the father's stamp of approval on the son's sacrifice, on Jesus' sacrifice. So think about the sacrifice of Jesus. This is what we talked about on Good Friday. Jesus was nailed to a tree... And there on the cross, everything we deserved, all of the wrath that your sin and my sin deserve, Jesus received. He took it all. He was crushed for our iniquities. He was pierced for our transgression. He took every last drop of the wrath of God for our sin. And the resurrection functions like a receipt for everything the dying love of Jesus has purchased for us. It's proof of payment. It's how we know the father was fully satisfied with the son's sacrifice for our sin. The the resurrection guarantees that great gospel promise. That that friends, if you are in Christ, you are no longer in your sin. 
That's what the resurrection is promising us. If you are in Christ, you're no longer in your sin. Easter announces grace for the guilty, forgiveness to sinners, pardon for God's enemies. That's what Easter is announcing to us. It makes peace possible. So, so really, this, this is the most important question you could ask yourself every Easter. Do you have peace with God? Peace is not earned by your good deeds, by your good living. Peace is earned by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Do you have peace with God? Uh, the Bible is clear on how we get peace with God. It, it is in the moment of us turning from our sin and throwing our life upon the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Friends, do you have peace with God? If you're wrong about this, it will not matter what else you're right about. The empty tomb makes peace possible. Friends, do you have peace with God? Has there been reconciliation between you and God? Have you thrown yourself on the mercy of God found in the person of Jesus, the risen Jesus? Have you made that decisive step toward him? Friends, if not, this is your moment. Right now where you are, you can cry out to Jesus. You can hold your life up before him and say, I am trusting in you, Jesus, your life, death, and resurrection. And he, the risen Jesus, will rescue you, save you, redeem you. Do you have peace with God? This is why the empty tomb is everything, because the empty tomb makes peace possible. Here's the second thing the empty tomb does. The empty tomb is everything to us because the empty tomb makes new things possible. New things possible. Uh, let's play a word association game. You know how the, the game works, right? Uh, I'll say a word and you just think about what's associated with it. So if I say blue, you might think of the word sky. If I say the word cat, you might think of Godforsaken, right? I mean, stuff like that. So uh, here is your word, powerful. What comes to mind when you hear the word powerful? Maybe it's words or a word like words, because words are really powerful. Uh, maybe you think of political leaders. Maybe you think of a tsunami. Maybe you think of nuclear bombs. But friends, the scriptures want us to see that the resurrection of Jesus is more powerful than anything else in the universe. They want us to see that. That the resurrection of Jesus is packed with more power than anything else in the universe. This is why Paul says in Philippians 3.10 that I want to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection. The scriptures want you to, to, when you think about the word powerful, that you would associate it with the word resurrection. That these two are tethered. And the scriptures don't just want you to think about these two words together. They want you to, to know and experience the power of the resurrection. So what kind of new things does the empty tomb make possible? Well, the empty tomb makes a new you possible. A new you possible. Uh, this is what Paul is trying to communicate to us in Romans chapter 6 verse 4 when he says, We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death. In order that, here's the result. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Now, I want you to see Paul's logic. Paul is looking at you and saying, hey, Christian, you can walk in newness of life. Change is possible. That, that can happen. The who that you are tomorrow and next week and next year can be different from the who that you are today. You, you can walk faithfully with Jesus. It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect tomorrow, but you can be progressing you can walk in newness of life. Now, why can we do that? How can we do that? On what basis can we do that? And here's Paul's answer. You can walk in newness of life just as Christ was raised from the dead. That's why. That's why. In other words, Paul is saying that the power that emptied the tomb is the same power that fills you if you're in Christ. But here's what happens to many of us. We look at our lives and the deep ruts of sin that have formed in our life. And, and maybe that deep rut of sin is uh, the pornography. 
Maybe it's impatience. Maybe it's a fear of man. Maybe it's lying. Maybe it's just that we are enslaved to worry and fear. What, whatever that deep rut of sin is, over time we begin to see that deep rut of sin as having ultimate power in our life. Uh, so we begin to look at our life and say things like, you know, I, I'll never be free from that fill in the blank. I'll never be free from th th this thing. This rut of sin will never be uprooted in my life. I'll never be free of these things. And friends, Easter announces to us every year that the resurrection of Jesus is more powerful than any rut of sin. It's more powerful. If you are in Christ, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead resides in you. How can we walk in newness of life? Here's how. Just as Christ was raised from the dead, that tomb emptying power is in you if you are in Christ. I, there's so many wonderful illustrations of that. One of the illustrations I love to pull from is Augustine. He was an early church father and Augustine was addicted. He addicted to lust, loose living. He was just dominated by these things. Then he tasted resurrection power. That, that same power that raised Jesus from the dead raised his dead heart to life. And that same power that raised his dead heart to life began to, to actually renew him and change him. And then years later, he came to one of the cities that he had an old mistress in. And his old mistress saw him and, and made a pass at him. I totally went for it. But it was to no avail. And she turned away uh, disappointed. And then she realized, oh, I think I know what's happened. It's just been too long since we've seen each other and he's forgotten who I am. So she turns back around and says, Augustine, it is I. And Augustine looks back at her and says, yes, I know, but it is no longer I. That is the difference the resurrection of Jesus makes in a human life. We can walk in newness of life. Augustine knew Jesus and the power of the resurrection. And friends, we have those stories all across our church family. People experiencing resurrection power, like Jesus has raised them to life and then he's began to, to renew them. That same power that emptied the tomb filled them and then it's begun to free them. They're actually walking in newness of life. And here is what I know. Many of us right here in this moment, in this room, really do believe that change is impossible in our life. That we're just never going to be free from these things. I'll, I'll never walk in newness of life. And friends, that's the very area that the scriptures, that Jesus is inviting you to invite resurrection power into. Where are those areas that need change in your life? that need newness in your life. The empty tomb makes that new life possible, a new you possible. But it doesn't just make a new you possible, it makes a new everything possible. A new everything possible. Friends, if the tomb is empty, reconciliation with that friend that you're like, that reconciliation is impossible. Friends, if the tomb is empty, that moment of reconciliation with that friend is possible. If the tomb is empty, your healing is possible. If the tomb is empty, your gloom turning to joy is actually possible. If the tomb is empty, your prodigal son, your prodigal daughter, your prodigal friend coming back home, it's actually possible. Friends, if the tomb is empty, your marriage, that you just feel like it's totally impossible, that it can ever be renewed. Friends, if the tomb is empty, it's possible. If the tomb is empty, that person that you think is just too too far gone for Jesus to rescue, for there to be newness of life in them. Friends, if the tomb is empty, it's possible. If the tomb is empty, darkness and disappointment, sadness and sin, hurt and heartbreak, do not get the last word the risen Jesus does. Amen? The empty tomb makes a new everything possible. So where is it in your life that you need resurrection power? The same power that raised Jesus from the dead to make some things new in your life. You should have a card in your seat. And we just want to encourage every single person who came today to scan that little QR code and to let us know where is it that you need resurrection power? Where do you need the power of Jesus to show up in your life? Every single one of us came in here this morning needing it somewhere. The question's where? 
Where do we need that resurrection power to show up? Friends, the empty tomb is everything because the empty tomb makes new things possible. And lastly, the empty tomb is everything because the empty tomb makes today matter. It makes your life matter. It makes today matter. I said this earlier, but 1 Corinthians 15 really is the resurrection chapter in the New Testament. It's all about the centrality of the resurrection, the importance of the resurrection. But I want you to notice how Paul finishes that resurrection chapter. Here it is in verse 58 of 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says, therefore, so in light of everything I've said about the resurrection, I want you to know the result of it, what it's meant to produce in your life. And here's what it's meant to produce. Therefore, my beloved brothers... Be steadfast. That's what the resurrection produces. Be immovable. That's what the resurrection produces in our life. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Here is how Paul ends that resurrection chapter. He wants to look at you and I and he wants us to know this. The good news of a resurrection empowers great lives. If you want to live a great life for Jesus, you have to look at the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. You have to give it your full attention. You have to keep gazing and keep gazing upon the resurrection of Jesus. Because it's the good news of a resurrection that empowers great lives. Lives that are always abounding in the work of the Lord. Not just a little bit of work of the Lord, but abounding in the work of the Lord. Not just sometimes, but but great lives who are always abounding in the work of the Lord. And what does it mean uh, to, to do the work of the Lord? I love how one commentator said it. He says, it means to fill your days with things that count for Christ. That's what it means to abound in the work of the Lord. It means your days are just full of the things that matter. That they're full of the things that count for Jesus' sake. The work of the Lord is helping people see the beauty of Jesus. It's telling people about Jesus. It's helping people grow up in Jesus. It's serving the downtrodden. It's creating beautiful things that reflect Jesus. It's using your vocation, all those hours that you spend at work, for the glory of Jesus. It's saying yes to everything that Jesus sets before you in your life. It's filling your days with the things that count for Christ. Friend, are you abounding in the work of the Lord? When you look at your life, would you say that that's what's making up my life? In my life is a lot of abounding for the work of Jesus. Because that's the very thing the resurrection wants to produce in your life. It's meant to produce you abounding in that sort of work, that sort of life. It's meant to produce a great life. Now, how does the resurrection do that? How does it produce a great life? How does it put gasoline in the tank of our life so that we're always abounding in the work of the Lord? Well, that last little phrase is the how. It's by doing this. It's by convincing us of this. It's by knowing that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. That's what the resurrection is meant to convince us of. That in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. The resurrection reminds us that there's more to this life than this life. The resurrection points us past this life to the life to come. And the resurrection, Paul's point here is uh, the resurrection is meant to convince us of this. That the resurrection of Jesus will take everything done for Jesus in this life and it will send it forward into the life to come where we will enjoy it forever. In other words... Every hard thing that you do for Jesus that no one else sees, only Jesus sees. But that hard thing, every moment of self-denial for Jesus' sake, every moment of telling someone about Jesus, every moment of laboring in prayer for Jesus' sake, every moment of sacrificial generosity, every moment of obedience to Jesus, The resurrection reminds us that every one of those moments are going to show up again on the other side of this life, in the life to come, in a new way, in a bigger way, in a brighter way, in a surprising way for you. Every one of those things are going to show up on the other side of this life. C.T. Studd was a missionary in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And he summarizes, I think, that last phrase in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, in a really beautiful way when he says it like this, only one life will soon be passed. 
And only what's done for Christ will last. That's what Paul's saying. Paul is saying you get one short little life. It's an unpredictable life. And everything you do for Jesus in that short little unpredictable life, everything done for Christ, it's going to last. That that your labor is not in vain. Your labor is going to last, friends. It's going to show up on the other side of this life in beautiful ways. So, So keep sacrificing. Be steadfast. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Brothers, let me just encourage you with this. Sisters. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. So, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Amen? Will you bow with me? I want to give you just a moment to open your heart and life up to Jesus and Here's your first question today. On this Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, do you have peace with God? Has reconciliation replaced the alienation? Have you made that decisive move toward God where you have turned from your sin and thrown your life upon the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus? Friends, this is where new life starts. And the empty tomb is everything because the empty tomb makes the peace that you need possible. So friends, if you have not done that, this is your moment, this Resurrection Sunday, to throw your life upon Jesus. Ask him for rescue. He stands so ready to rescue you. Friends, right now, there where you are, make that decisive move toward him. And that empty tomb makes a new everything possible. A new everything. A new you. A new marriage. But where do you need resurrection power to show up? Would you pour your heart out to Jesus in prayer right there in that area, asking for Jesus to work, asking for him to bring new power? Jesus, would you do that? Risen Jesus, would you do that? Would you bring newness of life today? Would you bring a new everything in our life today? God, we are trusting that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead can bring new life right here today. Oh God, would you do it? And it's in the name of the risen Jesus that we ask it. Amen. Would you stand and worship with us?
sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, the Lamb is overcome, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, the Lamb is overcome, so we sing hallelujah, we sing is alive. Serge, if the grave was not strong enough to hold him, and if death wasn't strong enough to defeat him, then is there anything too difficult for our God? Is there anything too difficult? Everything is on the table. That means all of the struggles that we have from day to day, our hardships, our tribulations, we serve a God who's able and mightier and greater than all of those things, amen? When we sing this next song, church, we just ask that you reflect on that. Everything that's going on, that you would trust that he's able. Amen. Why don't you help me sing this thing? When did I start to forget all of the great things you did? When did I throw away faith for the impossible? How did I start to believe that you weren't sufficient for me? You have no I talk myself out of seeing miracles. This is what we believe.
my hearts we sing to this Lord. You are more than able. Come on, one more time. church he is able to take dead people and make them alive that's what Christ has done he is risen church and for that we can celebrate him he did not let death have the final board but rather Jesus has the last word and it is a good word it is a word of hope and restoration and reconciliation with the one who made you and that's what we celebrate we celebrate every day the power of the resurrection that death is not the end of our story, but the end of our story is glory as we get to be with our heavenly father forever and ever. Will you take a seat? I'm gonna pray for our offering in just a second, but let me just say if you're visiting, don't feel obligated at all to participate in this part of the worship service. We are just so glad that you would join us on a Sunday, a Sunday where we as followers of Christ just come together to declare and celebrate and rejoice in the greatest news in human history, the day that changed all of human history. And we're just so glad that you would join us for a day like this. And what we'd love for you to do, um, if you want, is uh, right after service, you could go to our Connect desk. We'd have a gift for you. We'd love to help you get connected around Stonegate. We love gathering on Sundays, but really the life of our church happens throughout the week uh, in groups, in community. So any way we could help get you connected or take a next step with the Lord, we would love to do that. Or ways that we can pray for you or your family, we would feel so privileged to get to do that. And for everyone in the room, uh, you may have noticed there was a, a card on your seat. Uh, looked a little bit like this, got a QR code on the back because everything has a QR code in 2024. Um, and we would love if you would be so kind, uh, you can even do it right now. It's one of those moments where it's totally cool to get your phone out in church, or you can even do it um, when you're driving home, if you're not driving, if you're not the driver. And uh, on here, we would love for you to fill out just a quick uh, survey of any way we can help you take a next step. We want to help people take next steps in uh, following Jesus and, and, and what we were just singing about, of saying, Lord, you are more than able, um, that, that I wanna walk by faith, I wanna trust you, Lord. So any way we can help you take a next step, we wanna hear from you and ways that we can serve you as a church. Uh, we're here from you and we wanna do an incredible job just making it easy for you to take next steps in your relationship with Jesus here at Stonegate Church. Um, and then one last thing I wanna put on your radar is that next Sunday, uh, we're starting a brand new sermon series, uh, really creative title. Uh, the sermon series is called God. Um, and that's it, but it's worth exploring, isn't it? Uh, A.W. Tozer, a uh, great theologian from the 20th century, he once said this, the most important thing and shaping thing about us is what comes to mind when we think about God. Uh, that we think right things about God, that we think clear things, um, answering those big questions that we all have. God, can you be trusted? God, are you there? God, are you able? God, what is your heart like? God, who are you? And so if you even find yourself asking a lot of those questions, you're not gonna wanna miss this sermon series. We get to explore those things and to think biblically and rightly about the big, powerful, all loving God uh, that the Bible declares. And we wanna unpack that together as a church family. Uh, so let me pray for uh, the, uh, the end of our service and our offering, and then uh, we'll be dismissed here in just one second. God, this has been a glorious morning. Uh, your spirit is with us. It's moving in our hearts. There is resurrection power, resurrection power that can take hearts of stone and turn them into hearts of flesh. God, as you work and will in all of us, that we would put our faith and our trust in you, knowing that we were made for you, God that our hearts will remain restless until they find their rest in you. So God, for, for anyone in the room that, that is feeling that tug, that pull to turn from their sin and to turn to the resurrection power that's found in you alone, Jesus, would, would, they, would they move on that? Would they come forward right after service for prayer? And Lord, would you allow all of us to walk out of here as men and women as people that walk in a, a deep confidence 
that you, God, are able. You're able to, to be uh, big enough for anything we come up against. That the, your power, your spirit is moving in our lives. And because of that, we can trust you. And as a church, we can trust you with everything you've entrusted to us. And Lord, we can be good stewards of those resources you've given us. Uh, we can see more churches planted and missionaries sent out. And Lord, we pray all these things in your glorious name. Amen. All right, would you stand with me for our benediction as we close out our service? And let me just say, if you need prayer for anything, we'll have some of our post-service prayer leaders and elders down front. We would love to pray with you this morning. I know there's a lot of fun things to go do, and we all got busy schedules, but we're never too busy for prayer. So we would absolutely love to pray with you this morning. If you met Jesus, we'd love to celebrate with you and pray with you as well. Um, our benediction this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, which says this. Therefore, my beloved brothers... Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. We love you, church. Have a great week. See you next Sunday for our new sermon series.